Tonight, the congressman who's been called the intellectual godfather of the Tea Party, a man who came in second but just barely to Michelle Bachman in the Ames straw poll this weekend. Joining me now is Republican Ron Paul. Uh, Ron Paul, you're the most untalked about contender today <laughs> after this weekend I can ever remember. You should be getting as many headlines as Michelle Bachman. You nearly be her, and yet, oddly, the media seem completely obsessed with her and not obsessed with you. Why is that? Well, I should be asking you. You're part of the media. It's the media that picks and chooses, so I should ask the media well, what's I've going got you on, on here. I, you know, I, I'm making my statement. I, I, I've got you on my show. You know, uh, <laughs> so I'm looking for an explanation, too. But, you know, my supporters are convinced. They're afraid of me. They don't want my views out there. They're too dangerous. They want We want freedom, and we're challenging the status quo. We want to end the war. We want a gold standard. And their views that the people just can't handle. They can't handle all this freedom. They want dependency. They want socialism and welfareism. So I think they don't like to hear our views. But uh, I think we'll make the best of it, and we'll do very well. Uh, I think that uh, the Internet still is alive and well, and programs like yours will still have me on. <laughs> well, we certainly will, because it's, it's a fascinating part of the, of the preliminary stage, if you like, of the election battle. What do you think of Michelle Bartman? She clearly thinks that she has a chance now of becoming the nominee. What is your view? Well, she does. Her name's on the balance. She did very well on a straw poll, and she does identify with, uh, you know, some independent thinking people. She she does not want to be seen as status quo in the establishment. So uh, I I, uh, I know her well, and we've been friends. Uh, I just disagree with her views because I don't think uh, she's that far from the status quo as I would like her to be, and I would like this country to be. So her views are quite different on personal civil liberties and difference on foreign policy. Policy, and therefore, they will be different on personal liberty and spending habits as well. I mean, a lot of Democrats are putting it about today that, that uh, Michelle Bartman and you are uh, threats and should be taken seriously and you're dangerous. That normally means a coded language for they would love you both to do well because it'll rip the Republicans in half and probably guarantee President Obama wins the next election. Well, I, I don't know. I'm not too frightened about that. I think I do very well with the independents and, you know, even your own station there when you do uh, polling. I come out either first or second against Obama. So I think, I think the Democrats fear me. You know, when they try to pick uh, who they want to run against, when the Democrat picks, they say, well, we'd fear mostly John Huntsman. That's who we fear. But they never bring up the subject that I would slash into Obama's civil libertarian viewpoints. He doesn't really follow through on belief in personal liberties. And he does not, in, you know, support, uh, you know, ending the wars. He expanded the wars. So the progressive base has really left Obama. So I think the establishment that doesn't want the status quo challenge uh, would be most opposed to me. And quite frankly, the leadership in both parties are very supportive of the wars, are very supportive of the Federal Reserve. They're very supportive of the entitlement system. So therefore, both media and party-wise, uh, they would be very, very nervous about uh, us getting the, uh, the expression of support that we've got, and, and they want to squelch it if they can. So I don't think it's unusual. I've been used to this. This has been going on for a long time. So this, this is nothing exactly new. Uh, sometimes I'm very pleased with the progress we're making. And when we can win a poll, essentially tied in this poll in Iowa, I think it goes, shows great strength for our viewpoints and for our campaign. But tell me this, I mean, you're 75 years old now. You've served 12 terms in Congress. You've had two unsuccessful runs at the White House. And yet, perversely, despite all that, you actually have arrived at a position now where your views are more and more in line, I would imagine, with many you know, average Americans. They are fed up with Washington behavior. They can see that there is a need to cut spending dramatically. I would imagine most Americans are beginning to think that the troops should come out of Afghanistan and Iraq as well. This could be your time, couldn't it, Ron? But it might be your last chance. <laughs> I would uh, I, I would think we do have a very good chance, but I usually summarize this when I'm at the uh, rallies where we have good turnouts and I get a lot of applause. Freedom is popular. 
people like to be free, and especially when they see the failure of government. That's why so many people are coming our way, even those who would like these government programs and depend on governments. They realize we're flat out broke. This is one of the reasons why we're getting support on ending these wars. Even if they say, well, we need to be over there. We need to fill the vacuum. We're afraid things are going to happen. But they know we can't afford it. We have to borrow the money. We fight these wars. And they're talking about starting new ones all the time. We can't even keep up with all this. So this is very popular with the young people, especially. Freedom is a fantastic idea. And when you see the failure of government, we become more popular. Our views become more prevalent. And we are more mainstream than ever before. And the most magnificent thing is they have understood, you know, exactly how we pay for this. We don't, we can't tax enough. We can't borrow enough. So more and more people are understanding the Federal Reserve has something to do with this. Oh, you mean they print this money? The money's not back by anything? People are shocked. And then when you find out a third of the $15 trillion they pumped into the economy went to foreigners, some of them might have gone even to the British banks for all we know, you know. So, no, people are upset because they don't like to see the rich bailed out, the middle class shrunk, and the poor losing their houses. That's what they're fed up about. And the Austrian Free Market School of Economics explains it. We predicted it would happen. And believe me, the people are waking up to that fact. Uh, let me put this to you, Rob, because you're a charismatic guy. You did very well in this, in this straw poll. It doesn't mean an awful lot, but it's an indicator that you have a popular vote there. You nearly won it. What I hear about you is very experienced, charismatic, people like you. But the thing that holds you back is when you stray into extremity. You know, they don't like the fact you're so completely opposed to any foreign aid. They don't like the fact you want to legalize heroin. Many people don't like your total intransigence over any tax increase, particularly when you have someone like Warren Buffett saying, come on, hit the super rich harder. People don't like your intransigence over abortion, for example, where you don't believe even if someone is raped that they should be allowed an abortion. Are you prepared at this moment when everyone's wondering which way the Republicans are going to go. Are you prepared on some of these more extreme lines you've taken to soften, to moderate, to, in short, make yourself more electable? Well, why, why should somebody soften their viewpoint on defending the rule of law and defending the Constitution? That would be foolish. The extremists are in charge. They've been in charge, especially for the last 40 years, since they've been allowed to print money at will. So that's why we've extended ourselves overseas. That's why we have runaway spending with our entitlement system. That's why we have inflation, depression, recessions, and all of these things. That is so extreme. This idea that you have, you know, a couple trillion, this year, our entitlements and debt has obligated our people to $5 trillion. And they think, I'm extreme? I mean, this is weird. And they say, oh, no, we'll just print up the money, you know, and, and it'll, everybody will be wealthy. But unfortunately, they give out the money, and it goes to the wealthy people. The poor get poorer. That is weird. That is, you know, well, I, it's really bad. It's bad economics. It's bad morality. It doesn't conform with our Constitution. And the people know this. They're really waking up to this. And, and this seems to be, most people come up to me and they say, what you say is common sense. It's not like I'm spouting off some extreme position. Yeah, hang, on, hang, on, Ron, Ron, hang on a second. Yes. Hang okay. on a second. I don't, think, I don't think people are rushing up to you in the streets of America saying legalize heroin. That's common sense, are they? No, and I and, and, and in fair fairness to me, I've never used the word heroin once in a campaign ever in 30 years. Though so it's somebody in the media says, "Oh, now we're going to interpret." He said this might mean that he would allow the states to do such and such. All I'm saying is people ought to have freedom of choice, just as you have freedom of choice in your First Amendment rights, picking and choosing what you do and say on TV. I just think personal personal uh, choices. I mean, I usually use the example of personal choices to say, why is it that the federal government comes down with a SWAT team to arrest people who drink raw milk? You know, what has happened in this country? So I never use the drug as an example because I know how people demagogue it. But it is true. You know, there was a time in our history not too long ago, there were no federal laws against marijuana in 1937 before that. So this is rather new. We've spent a trillion dollars on the war on drugs, and it, it hasn't done one thing except enhance the drug dealers. So this idea, you can take my philosophy, and I'm not I'm accusing you of doing it, but others have, take my philosophy and say, oh, Ron Paul, his philosophy is he's going to legalize heroin. You know, it, uh, that is, is that's but a gross decision. Wrong, I want to legalize freedom. Pardon me? If you're such, if you're such a, a, 
uh, protagonist for people's choice and freedom of choice. Why are you so implacably opposed to same-sex marriage and to any of form of abortion under any circumstances? That's not supporting well, I, choice. I, I is think it? you're mixed. I think you're mixed up. I'm against the marriage amendment, and I believe people can do what they want. I don't even want the government involved in marriage. Anybody can do what they want and call it whatever they want. They shouldn't force their will on other people. You know, abortion, I just recognize as a physician and a scientist that life does exist prior to birth. Uh, there's a legal right to it, and there's a biological definition of it. And most people don't think about it. That if you say that the woman has a right uh, to do what she wants with her body and what is in her body, that means that an eight-pound baby a month before birth can be destroyed and the doctor be paid for it. There's something awfully bizarre about a society that says, oh, that's okay because it's a woman's body. And every argument for all abortion endorses the principle that you can take that life and, and abort it and kill it. And I had to witness this. It's very, very disturbing. So uh, I, I think that uh, somebody has to speak for the weak and the small, and they do have legal rights. If you're in a car accident and, and a woman's pregnant and she her baby dies, you're you're this is homicide. You've you've committed a very serious crime. You killed a life. So this whole thing that is simple, the woman's right to do what she wants with her own body. No, you have to deal with the fact. You have to decide: is there a real life there? And there is a real life there. I'm liable as a physician if if the woman comes in if she's a week pregnant or ten months pregnant or was eight nine months pregnant. If I do something wrong, rightfully so, I can be liable for injuring the fetus. So if I give her the wrong medication. I'm liable for this. To pretend that life doesn't exist, that's like putting blinders on. And, and I, have, I don't talk a whole lot about it, but I made the emphasis the other day that if you truly care about liberty, you have to understand life. Because how can I defend a woman's uh, or any individual's right to lead their own life as they choose and even do dumb things and drink raw milk or whatever they would want to do? At the same, at the same time, say that life is not precious and uh, we can throw away a life uh, even if it weighs eight pounds because it's within the woman's body. I believe in property rights. I believe that a baby in a crib deserves protection even though I honor property and a house is our castle. But nobody, nobody would say, oh, a woman after the baby's born, we can kill it. And uh, today we have this, all these abortions done, but if a young girl is in a desperate situation and she happens to deliver her baby and kills it, she's arrested immediately. But if she'd have done it a day before, there was no crime and the doctor gets paid money. That even if you just divorce this all from the law and enforcement of law, but morality, our society has to decide whether that's morally right or wrong in dealing with this. I have high respect for life, therefore I have high respect for liberty. Okay, and it's Ron, hard to separate you've, made your, you've made your point very forcefully, uh, as always. There will be lots of people watching who vehemently disagree with you, but that is the beauty of a democracy, and I appreciate you joining me. Thank you. Good to be with you.